So for the last couple of weeks, we've been exploring the impact of guilt, shame, and blame, and how to shift those by taking responsibility. And last week, we talked about this concept of forgiveness, and forgiveness being the activity that results when we stop blaming and pointing fingers. That in the absence of guilt, shame, and blame, forgiveness becomes unnecessary because we haven't vilified anybody in the first place. And we talked last week about this concept of forgiveness being demonstrated by giving someone free passage through our consciousness. And somehow that got heard as I get to vomit all of my ills on you and then point out that you are to give me safe passage through your mind regardless of what I do. That ain't what I said. <laughs> Let's just clear that up right now. That is not what I said. I did not say you now have license to go be a completely nasty human being and demand safe passage through everybody's mind who you step on. That's not what I said. But that apparently is what a couple of folks heard. So, you, you know, it's like that. <laughs> this is the stuff they don't tell you in ministerial school. <laughs> but someday you're going to get an email that said, Rev. Rafe said. <laughs> and none of it is what Rev. Rafe said, and it's being used to hurt people. Even if I misspeak, that doesn't mean use it to hurt people any more than when you speak, you want somebody to use your words to hurt people. That's not what we're doing here. So if that's coming up for you, that's your stuff. <laughs> and call me. I will sit in the trench with you while we look at it. While we unwrap whatever is going on that is hurting so deeply that you need to hurt other people so you have pain, so you have company in your pain. Because hurt people hurt people. We know that. So I want to make space that if you're one of those folks that are hurting people because you're hurt, let's sit down and heal. Let's sit down and heal. And I love the synchronicity. <laughs> I truly, truly do. Because today's talk is about choose to live. And if you've been here for any length of time, you have heard me reference page 270 in the Science of Mind book, where it talks about the difference between right and wrong, where Ernest Holmes very clearly articulates the criterion for any... I'm going to make this gender neutral as I read... The criterion for any individual as to what is right or wrong for them is not to be found in some other person's judgment. The criterion is, does the thing I wish to do express more life, more happiness, more peace to myself, and at the same time harm no one? Now that's pretty clear. Except when we get into our self-justifying, self-rationalizing definition of what is harm. And we have the ability to do that, to rationalize hurting other people and actually convince ourselves that, well, they're responsible for how they receive whatever I do. And I would invite you to consider that that is a complete misuse of spirituality and of the law. 
And Ernest Holmes talks in depth about that in this chapter. Um, if you have a book, I invite you to go to chapter 16 and really absorb that chapter. The title of the chapter is The Principles of Successful Living. And he really outlines how it is that we do this. And he articulates some things about choosing to live that may be different than what a lot of us think living looks like. One of the things that he says is this. The law is a law of liberty, but not a law of license. <laughs> the law is a law of liberty, but not a law of license. We don't have carte blanche to just do whatever we want, regardless of how it impacts one another. He goes on to say, all nature conspires to produce and manifest the freedom of the individual that it may unloose its own energy. Now, ours is one of science and of the mind. And so scientifically, energy is literally defined as the capacity to change, the capacity to do work. So what we're really talking about there is unloosing the individualized capacity to be however spirit wants to be as us. And we fall into the trap, just like any other faith tradition does, of what does God want me to be? God doesn't know what you're going to be until you be it. Everybody hear that? There's nothing outside of you that's going to send you a message of what you are to be. That would require that you are separate from source. The message is going to come from you because you are the divine in form. And when we get clear about that, we stop listening out here and we start listening here. There is no God that has a book that says, okay, and Rafe is going to do this, and then Rafe is going to do that, and then this is going to happen, but I'm going to use that to bring Rafe right around over here so he really gets how he's supposed to show up. That's not happening. It's not happening in my life. It's not happening in your life. What is happening is spirit is diversified itself. Just like we all start as one cell, in human form, and that one cell replicates itself identically until some point that science still cannot explain, that one cell, that identical cell, suddenly differentiates itself. That's right, Toby said, that's how I got here. Freeze, Toby. <laughs> And suddenly, these cells that were identical become a liver and a kidney and a heart and an arm and a leg. And nobody quite knows how that happens. We just know that it happens. That's the same thing that happened in creation that created each one of us. We are diversified cells in the body of the infinite. And so, just like Toby doesn't know what Toby's going to do until Toby does it, <laughs> the divine doesn't know what it's going to do until we do it. Okay? So that is the responsibility and the freedom that we have. Ernest Holmes goes on in this same... <clears throat> He's talking about how we express life. 
For instance, the love of a mother for her child, of a man for his wife, a patriot for his country, a preacher for his religion, an artist for his art. <laughs> All of these are but ways of self-fulfillment. This is legitimate self-expression. We don't know how we're going to show up. I certainly did not know when I was Toby's size that I'd be standing here doing this. I didn't know that. I didn't know the road I was going to take to get here. You didn't know the path you were going to take to get here. But here we all are. And every expression is flawless and the people that we stepped on along the way are places for us to learn to accept responsibility. Are places for us to learn to adjust. Because that is not divinity expressing itself. That is ego driving the bus. And it's not an either or. You will never hear me talk about getting rid of your ego because in order to do that, you have to leave the planet. <laughs> Why would I invite you to do that? But what I will suggest is that you take the ego out of the driver's seat, give it a job to keep it occupied, <laughs> because it needs a job. Give it something to do that keeps your physical being alive, and then put your spiritual self in the driver's seat. Be clear about who's in charge of how you're expressing. Because this idea that I just get to vomit anything I want on you and it's, just, it's supposed to be okay, that's what Holmes was talking about by this is one, not of license, but of liberty. I don't have the license to do that at all. And then suggest that somehow you just find it within yourself to excuse my inappropriate behavior that I thoughtfully, intentionally subjected you to. I get to do what brings me more joy, more happiness, more life, and at the same time harms no one. So stop using spirituality to excuse your harmful behavior. Holmes goes on to talk about we do not exist for the purpose of making an impression upon our environment. We do exist to express ourselves in and through our environment. There is a great difference. We do not exist to leave a lasting impression upon our environment. Not at all. It is not necessary that we leave any impression. It is not necessary if we should pass tonight that anyone should remember that we even ever lived. Everybody's ego just went... <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could show you the, a flash of everybody's face. It's just, the total ego in the room just went, what? <laughs> See, our ego is here to make an impression. Our ego is about this idea of permanence. And our spiritual is about knowing impermanence. Ernest Holmes in his own writings said, someday, appropriately so, everything I have written will find its way to the trash can. <coughs> Did you know that? That he said that? <laughs> because as we grow, as we know more, what we used to know becomes irrelevant. We're not still using the same technology that our grandparents used. I wouldn't have this thing hanging off my ear if we were. We wouldn't have these really cool Christmas lights if we were. 
we're supposed to evolve. It doesn't mean we don't have memory, but it does mean that, that we can't leave this foot in the past and we can't go on into the future. <laughs> I mean, eventually we're kind of stuck. If I don't do this, I'm never going to move anywhere. And we can only stretch so far. He goes on to say, All that means anything is that while we live, and then he puts in all caps, we live. And wherever we go from here, we shall keep living. So what does it mean to actually live? If it's not about this earth, if it's not about leaving a legacy, if it's not about the permanence of our human expression, what the heck is it about? Could it be? I'm just going to toss this out for you to consider. Could it be that it actually is for the expansion of spirit's experience of itself? Could it be that we are here solely for the purpose of showing God a good time. <laughs> Think about that. What if that's your only obligation? Is to show what created you a good time of itself as your life. What would you do different? Would you restrict and constrict and sit around staring at your bank account waiting for it to change so you could be you? I'm not alone. See, we spend so much time not living because we can't afford to live or someone will have an opinion about how I live. Or if I step fully into who I am, people in my life might go away. Or if I step fully into my life, I might go away. <laughs> who I understand myself to be may cease to exist. Hallelujah! <laughs> Hallelujah! If who you think you are ceases to exist. Now that might feel a little uncomfortable, but here's the thing. The more you step into the truth of you, the bigger the expression of you gets, and that can't be bad. It's only the ego that whispers in our ear, I'm becoming irrelevant, stop it. <laughs> Don't see me when they look at you. Stop it. <laughs> people are talking about you. Stop it. You know how you know people are talking about you? Because you're talking about other people. <laughs> you know how you know people are going to judge you? Because you judge other people. Stop acting like you don't know the source. <laughs> Seriously. We know it because we do it. And the invitation is to be more than you know yourself to be. To dare to live out loud. Boldly. Without one shred of give a rat's rear end about what anybody else thinks about you. Because if you're living to someone else's standard, you're living to someone else's degree of your misery. You're allowing someone else to dictate your feelings. And there is nowhere to go but guilt, shame, and blame. 
Because if they don't expand, then you don't get to expand. Now ultimately, it's nobody's fault. It's simply your choice. It's not even your fault. It's just a choice. And the power of choice is that every time you make one, you can make a different one. And you don't even have to backtrack. You don't have to go back and undo a thing. You can just start doing a new thing. Really get that. You don't have to go back and unravel nothing. Just start living now. No if, no when, no because. Just live. And stop explaining yourself. Stop justifying yourself. Stop it. Just be the magnificent you he came here to be. And if you're not sure who that is, I invite you to get quiet and ask the only person that could possibly have that answer. And that's you. If we will go into the stillness and just simply say, what is mine to do now? <coughs> not ten years from now. Not, it's certainly not yesterday. But what is mine to do now? And you'll know when it's clarity because it resonates with clarity. Guitar players will tell you when they're tuning their guitar strings, they're listening for one vibration. Because when those two strings are in pitch, there's one vibration. If there's a if there's two vibrations, something's out. So when you resonate with that one vibration, there's your yes. There's your knowing. Just do it. Just step into it. Even if it's something as seemingly benign as go to the grocery store and buy a box of crackers. And I know that might sound silly, but you'd be amazed the things that happen when people just follow that nudge to go to the grocery store, even if they don't need anything. <laughs> I have a personal friend who, trying to grow a center, Go, go to the grocery store. Why? I don't need anything. Go to the grocery store. <laughs> I don't need go to the grocery store. So she went to the grocery store. Okay, I'm here. What do you want? Just get in line. Okay. Long story short, she got in. She fired. Okay, fine. Got this. I'm, I have no idea what I'm doing here other than following. Total stranger in line behind her engaged her in a conversation. And before they were both finished through the line, this total stranger made a $10,000 donation to the center she was trying to found. We don't know where it's going. That's none of our business. Our business is to listen when we have the clarity to simply do it. To trust. That's living by faith. That's living. Everything else is strategic planning. <laughs> living requires no strategic planning because you have no idea where it's going. <laughs> Seriously. To truly live in the moment, this is it. Now this is it. Now this is it. And on the human level, it's crazy making. So just know that. It's not going to stop the ego. In fact, it's going to unleash your ego. The more it has been in control, the louder it's going to be. So when you really step into living and your ego starts freaking out, that just means you're doing it right. <laughs> so then you have compassion with your ego. And you wrap your ego up. And you love it. And you give it a job. 
Yeah? When I tell you to give your ego a job, I'm totally serious. Because it needs something to do to keep it busy. Or it will keep you busy. Okay? It will distract you. It will acknowledge you. And you don't have to hate it when it starts whispering in your ear. Yeah, I know. You're exactly right. They were talking about you. And we're going to go do this. So, and I literally... <laughs> I'm glad my dogs can't talk. Because <laughs> I talk to my ego at home frequently, out loud, and they're like, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> How do you do that? Who are you talking to? But it's not uncommon for me to tell my ego, okay, I get that's what you think needs to happen. So just so you know, this is what I'm going to do. And if you want to stay on the couch and just wait till I get back, that's fine. But here I'm going. So see ya. And then I walk out the door, and lo and behold, it comes with me. <laughs> it has never just stayed on the couch. <laughs> so when it threatens to do things, call its bluff. Seriously, because your ego will. I'm not going. Okay, fine, stay here. See what happens. It will come. Promise. <laughs> you can't drive off without it. Live. So much of what causes us discomfort in our lives isn't what's happening, but what's not happening. Okay? It's our refusal to step fully into our brilliance, into our magnificence. And like I've told you all along, just try it. Just step into being fully, magnificently, unbridled, undefended you. Give it six months. And if it doesn't work, I promise I will refund your misery. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> I adore you and I want you to know your magnificence. And so I'm going to keep pushing you to be more than you know you can be. And if that annoys your ego, <laughs> this is to all the egos in the room. Email me. Keep those cards and letters coming. Come sit down with me and the other egos on Tuesday and we will have a conversation to help you understand your place in the divine life that you're living in. That you're no longer in charge. The divine is in charge and everyone in the sound of my voice is going to love your ego. They're going to love you, little ego. And you're going in the passenger seat. You don't get to drive everybody's bus anymore. And that doesn't mean you're not wanted. It doesn't mean you're not loved. It just means you're not in charge. And you'll adjust. And you might even enjoy the ride. Let's take this into prayer. <sighs> what I know is that there is only one infinite, ever-present allness. This one is simultaneously the source, its creation, and the activity that creates. It is continuous, so it is happening now. It is that source, that impulse, that energy, that movement, that love, peace, power, presence, that simply wants to know more of itself that wants to experience more joy, more peace, more beauty, more presence. And so it creates itself in multiplicity, in diversity, in brilliant, exquisite, individualized forms. 
each infused with the complete freedom to express uniquely, exquisitely, unrestrained brilliance. Hmm. This is the truth of who and what we each are. That we are quite literally the divine in form, knowing itself, being itself, expressing itself as each form. And so in that truth, I speak my word, claiming and affirming, calling forth the brilliant, unrestrained expression of divinity that blows this planet wide open to an experience of itself of joy beyond what it can comprehend of beauty beyond what it can comprehend a flow of abundance that shatters every notion of limitation <laughs> that demonstrates the full depth and breadth of the infinite givingness of spirit to itself and as the words leave my mouth and move into the law, I hear them with my human ears and this activity of my heart opens knowing the truth of these words. The gratitude of faith of knowing the truth opens within me, fills me to overflowing. <laughs> How good it is to know that just as quickly as the words are formed in mind and spoken in voice, that that which created them fulfills them. <laughs> it's the perfect, perfect unity of multiplicity. Saying yes to itself, always in all ways. And so I know that it's already done. So I let go and I move into the next moment looking for the evidence and form of the fulfillment of the word made whole. And I invite you, if this is your prayer as well, to join me as we anchor it by saying, yes. And so it is.